we've been thinking about, just over the last few years, of expressing how we operate as a church in four movements. We have an upward movement, which is about looking to God, receiving the extraordinary love that he has uh, poured out on us and expressing, responding to that love in worship, just beginning to grow in our relationship with God. We want to deepen that relationship with God through worship, through teaching, through prayer. Um, That's an upward movement. There's an inward movement, which is about loving one another. Jesus said that by your love for one another, people will know that you're my disciples. That speaks of a Christian community, which is a dynamic community of people who love each other in a way that says something to the world, where the world just says, wow, that is an amazing thing that's going on. I want to be part of that community. That inward movement. And we express that through our connect groups and through deepening our relationships in the church. Connect groups are our midweek groups. There's an outward movement, which is about loving our neighbor. One of the great commands of, of God. Actually, not because we should, we must, you know, we, we're programmed to love our neighbors. No, I don't think we are. I think it's something which we need to um, act on ourselves. But actually, to see that other people can experience the love of God as well. We, you know, God's call is to go into the world and make disciples. We want everyone to be able to hear at least the good news about Jesus and to be changed by him for the better, that outward movement. And we're learning how to do that in a city where people just don't know their neighbors, to begin to get to know our physical neighbors, but also to actively engage with our networks of neighbors as well, the people we connect with and relate to every day in our places of work or our friendship circles and so on beginning to not just do acts of kindness and love, but actually to talk about that love and and where that comes from. And then there's this fourth dimension, which is about a forward dimension. It's where we're beginning to think in the long term about what God has called us to be and do here. So it's not just thinking about a year ahead or three, three years ahead or five years ahead, but actually thinking about a whole generation, 25 years ahead. What, what kind of impact can we as a church make over a whole generation? How can we be like a catalyst where we start, um, you know, with a small group of people, we can impact a very, very large group of people? How can we build partnerships with other churches and other groups who are working for the good in our community so that together, we can't do it alone, but together we can do extraordinary things together. And the whole idea about a legacy, leaving a legacy behind us. So some of us might be here for just a short amount of time but we can receive a baton from others and pass it on to others when we leave, that it's actually building significant work in the life of this community that is going to outlast our stay here. Building a legacy that lasts. Thinking about 25 square miles, a larger area, and not just for this time, but, um, but over 25 years, 25 square miles. So at St. Paul's, our vision is we want to see this area transformed but also the whole of Tower Hamlets, the whole of East London transformed. And we can begin to start, particularly when you start thinking 25 years, you can begin to start thinking how that might be possible. And what might that transformation look like in practice? Well, it looks like people coming to know Jesus Christ, being changed by him, beginning to join a Christian community. It looks like marriages restored, and put back together and saved. It looks like children who grow up in a safe and secure environment where they um, play a part, an act and good part in society to bless society. It looks like the hurting healed. It looks like the broken put back together again. It looks like those who are addicts set free. It looks like people who are lonely, befriended and finding life and health and strength. It is a transformed community. That's what God can do to people and a community when he is active and at work amongst them. If that's what it looks like, how, how is that possible? How can we do it? Because actually, as human beings, that's what governments and social services have been trying to do for generations. Well, we do it by recognizing actually we can't do it ourselves. We do it by joining in with what God is doing what he's already doing. We join in with what he's doing. And that's what we see so much in this passage. So do have a look at this passage in Acts. a fantastic story of um, Philip, the apostle, um, someone who'd followed Jesus for um, three years. 
And here we see he's um, active in sharing his faith. He's ready to share his faith. And he finds himself speaking to someone of a completely different culture, a completely different religion, a completely different background. And God is using him to transform not just this person's life, but a whole nation and perhaps a whole continent just in a single conversation. So the first thing we see here is that Philip was looking out for seekers. And God wants us to look out for seekers, people who are seeking after him. Let's uh, pick up the story. Acts chapter 8 and verse 26. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasure of the Kandake, uh, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. So lots of things in there. We've got this Ethiopian who, he's a eunuch, so he wasn't allowed into the temple. He's from Ethiopia, so he probably wasn't a Jew. And yet he's gone to the temple to worship. He's gone to Jerusalem to worship. He's fascinated by this faith in a personal God who created the universe. And he's only allowed so far in. The Jewish faith said, if you're a eunuch, you're not allowed to go into the temple precincts. You're not allowed to come close to God in that sense. But you can stand at a distance and honor him. So this man is fascinated with God. He's, he's searching, and he's actually got um, an Old Testament um, in front of him. He's reading the scroll of Isaiah the prophet. He's reading, he's, he's fascinated with God. He's, he's, he's gripped with him. He's trying to work out what this God is about, who he is. I think it's just very interesting to think, I, I just try and imagine the scene of him sitting in this chariot reading this scroll. Because it, it's like, you know, what is that actually like? Um, it's slow enough for someone to run up, unless he's Superman, um, trying to keep up with this fast-moving chariot. So it's quite a slow-moving chariot, um, fast enough for Philip as he's running along just to see what's going on. And is this like a chauffeur-driven car? I, don't, I mean, he's trying to just imagine what this chariot is like. He can't be kind of um, egging on the horses when he's reading as well, so someone else must be there. And he's just being carried along, and he's reading enough for Philip to see what's going on. But here is someone seeking answers. And you know, in our nation, which is, we, the press um, really pushes so much secularism around and so much cynicism about the Christian faith, that I think we, as Christians, pick up this sense that we are under attack all the time and that the whole nation's against us. That actually only, if you look at the statistics, only about 10% of people go to church regularly. About 5% of those are Church of England. 5% of the whole. And we feel that actually we're in defensive mode. We feel that everyone is attacking our understanding of God. But I have to say, that is not true. Um, I don't know if you um, followed the um, uh, press a couple of weeks ago. Richard Dawkins Foundation um, did some research into um, religious attitudes. And this is obviously used to attack Christianity, so that's why it's been... Um, uh, put together. But actually, as it's published, there's some very interesting things which I think are very helpful for us. So they did this survey and uh, of a thousand people, a sample, and um, they then asked how many of you are, would describe yourselves as Christian in a survey. And then he specifically um, asks those people who say they're Christians um, to answer some questions. So it's very much after what is going on with Christianity in this country. And so of the response of this thousand people, 54% said that they were Christian. So 54%. So just think about that in itself. 54% on a survey where they could choose lots of things, including prefer not to say, don't know any other religion or anything like that. 54% said they're Christian. So if, just taking a step back, 10%, 50%, there's another 40% of potential of people who already say they're Christian. Okay. Here's a question. If you're a Christian, how often would you attend church? Um, in the last 12 months. Now, once a week or more, that's the regular um, Christians, so we'll take those people out of it. But 27% said they occasionally uh, attend church. So, according to the national average, if you scale it up, 14% of people say they come to church 
more than once a year, not for a wedding, funeral, or baptism, not for Christmas or Easter. They just come to church. So there must be some interest in that 14% of people who are actually actively, they're, they're ready to engage with church in some way. Look at another stat here. So this is, you know, different people believe in different things. To what extent do you personally believe in the following? And there's one which is the power of prayer. 40% of people nationally believe in either completely or to some extent the power of prayer. So if only 10% of the country come to church, but another 30%, assuming the 10% believe in the power of prayer, uh, the 30% more believe in the power of prayer. They believe they're Christians and they actually believe that God can answer prayer in some way. That sounds to me like an opportunity to invite people to explore that a bit more. Very interesting. I'd love to go through the whole thing with you, but I can't look online. Um, Here's another one. Overall, how important, if at all, is Christianity in your life? 60% of the respondents, so that's 30% nationally of people, said that Christianity is important in their lives. Now, if 10% of people, I hope you're following this, it's quite complicated, but 10% of the nation goes to church, they think it's important. Another 20% of people who don't go to church in the country say that Christianity is important in their lives. They just don't go to church. To me, that is an opportunity that God is giving the church to invite those people in some way, to connect with them in some way so that they can experience and know the reality of the, the God who they believe in who they believe that prayer works for, that um, they believe that is important in their lives. They just haven't kind of made the full connection with, with them. We, we, I don't think we need to um, rebuke them or something for not responding. We need to find the right invitation for them to come. People are interested in the Christian faith. They are seeking, but we just don't see it because of the way things are framed and the way things are, are put, particularly in the press and, and nationally. So... To my mind, there is an opportunity that is actually there in, in black and white for us to be able to see an opportunity to reach out to people who are interested already, who are perhaps even seeking actively. I, I think you know, one of the things that I'm involved in is I'm helping other churches to plant churches. And part of that strategy of planting churches is to see the Church of England double in size over the next 20 years. If you set the target, you say, Lord, how can we see this, you know, our church double in size? He's already given us all the instructions in terms of go, go and tell people. And church planting is one of those strategies to see new, commu- new communities experiencing the, um, the love of God. What can we do? We can pray for people. One of the things we're encouraging people this year to do is have a list of 10 people that you pray for. Just write them down. Say, Lord, who should be on this 10? Don't stop at 10 if you want to, but if you can't, haven't got the full 10, start with what you've got and then add to it over the year. But pray for 10 people. Pray that God would speak to those people. Pray for opportunities to talk to them about your faith. Pray for an opportunity to invite them. And you'd be surprised at what might happen over this year. Pray. Look out for seekers. Secondly, seize every opportunity. Let's pick up the story again. So Philip, verse 30, ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? How can I unless someone explains it to me? Okay, that's a great open invitation, isn't it? (laughs) Um, They don't often happen, but actually I think it comes from, do you understand what you're reading? The question that Philip asks him, he invites a response. And so the Ethiopian invites Philip to come up and sit with him. Here you've got this um, Philip. I don't know that much about Philip, but he probably didn't come from uh, the same kind of background as this Ethiopian. This Ethiopian would have been highly trusted. He was a senior official in the government in Ethiopia. He would have been very, very wealthy. And um, Philip, um, following the, probably the teachings of Jesus and hanging out with him for three years, wouldn't have had much at all. He's given it all away. So they're very different social backgrounds, different um, Uh, national backgrounds, different religious backgrounds. And Philip is invited to join him. And they're studying this passage of scripture, which is from Isaiah 53. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. 
Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Okay, they're just beginning to engage and raising questions. And Philip began with this very passage of scripture and told him about the good news about Jesus. We talked last week about the 10 seconds gospel. Shall I tell you the 10 second gospel? The Christian message in 10 seconds is like this. God made us for a relationship with him. We blew it. God sent his son, Jesus, to die for us, to rescue us um, for this relationship. You can receive him. It's about 10 seconds, 12 maybe. (laughs) It's simple enough to say in 12 seconds. It's deep enough to spend a whole lifetime exploring. Philip had these few minutes in a chariot, in a car ride, to explain the Christian faith to this Ethiopian. And he starts with where he's at. He starts with the seeking that he's doing. He starts with the questions that this man is raising. And he takes him on a journey to explain the big story. He seized the opportunity that was presented to him. When we look for opportunities, God will give them to us. And we have a choice whether to take them or leave them. We've been encouraging each other on our staff team to tell stories about what God's um, doing uh, um, amongst us. And um, uh, Rich was telling us, Rich Grant, who's actually away this weekend on a training weekend with his um, theological training. And it's very difficult to get to know people Um, in that environment and so he's praying and he um, ends up in a lift with a man who's dressed in running clothes and Rich is training for the marathon so they thought oh here's an opportunity so um, he engages in the conversation and they've got the lift ride to um, to just get to know each other and at the end of it he just says goodbye and and he's thinking afterwards oh you know Lord I wish I'd exchanged a phone number or something so we could connect again and the next day he meets the same person. He never sees the same person in the lift at the same time. So he meets the same person and says, oh, hello again. And um, at this time he was dressed in a suit, so he didn't re- recognize him to start with, but he just made the, put two and two together. And I think the other man actually said hello to him. And um, they exchange phone numbers and they're going to do some training together. And just thought, actually, this is amazing. God is helping me to meet my neighbors and um, to, you know, to just actively engage in something that would have been just a... Um, you know, passing, well, no contact at all. In the same breath, he's praying, Lord, help me to um, seek your opportunities. And um, he comes to church here, and um, on the steps just outside in the middle of the day, there's someone who is looking pretty sad and upset and um, starts talking to him. And the man says, uh, my car's broken down outside church. And as he talks to him more, he says, actually, I've broken up with my um, partner. And I'm, you know, I'm devastated. And so they pray together. And one of the observations they realize in, um, as they're talking together is, what are the chances of a, of a car breaking down um, outside a church? And there being someone who can talk to them about the Lord and talk about how he could be of help as they pray together. Actively seeking opportunities, seizing those moments when they come. And we don't know the impact of both of those um, relationships and short moments. But if it's anything like this, there are some of those occasions where it has a profound and significant um, impact. One of the things that um, we want to encourage the church to do this year is we've got Invite 2012, this um, uh, kind of brand that we're branding the year with. This is what we want to encourage everyone to do, is to begin to think, actually, how can I get good at sharing my faith? How can I do it in a way that relates to me? How can I do it in such a way that we can bring the truth and the amazing good news about Jesus to perhaps those 20 more percent of the country who are actively saying, I I kind of believe this stuff, I'd like to find out more. They might not be saying, I'd like to find out more yet, but they, they might be open to that. How can we share our faith? Not in a way that kind of rams, rams it down people's throats, but in a way that people can receive and um, accept. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to encourage people to learn, to train, to um, give people opportunities. We've been exploring this series, the Contagious Christian series, um, in our Connect groups. 
And we want to just learn how, how to do this. And we're going to keep on doing that through the year. Invite 2012. Because God wants everyone to know him. To invite people to meet Jesus. That's what it's about. And some of those invitations might go on to actually be an invitation to church. And that's why it's great to have, you know, we want to have a church full of people who are invited, not just people who are members. Invite 2012. We can all pray. We can all invite, not to see our church grow, but actually so that people can meet him. And that's why we want to invest in our site. We, Ed hinted at it. It would be great to do some bit more work on the um, projection systems and so on. Um, but actually, we want to develop this site. So it's good for, not just for Sunday services, but we're using it more and more through the week for our neighbors, for this community. So it's about, so let's have some of those pictures. It's about being able to um, develop the galleries so that um, when the church is, you know, with children in here, it's actually full. And if more and more, you know, there's not much space to expand here, so we need to expand up there. So we need projection and we need sound systems in there. That's kind of, um, that just needs investment. We need to develop the lighting in here so that um, you can actually see in the dark. In the, in the evenings, it's dark, and upstairs, you can't really see very much. So we want to develop all those things. We want to um, develop the loos. Um, uh, next one. That's not a loo. This is the loo. Um, uh, there's one loo in this building um, on this floor, and we want to be able to have more loos. This is just one part of it. We think we might be able to put another one as well. So just disabled um, facilities as well as um, just increasing the capacity. The other one, the refreshment room, we want to develop this space. If you've, um, I was saying this last week, I think maybe people are a little bit shocked, but we get the water for coffee from the loo because there's one tap. Now, we don't actually get it from the loo itself. We get it from the tap in the basin, okay? <laughs> we get that from the basin in, in um, the loo, and we bring it to the refreshment room. We put it in a very strong water boiler, and we produce coffee. Actually, it's for all safe, don't worry. But um, actually, wouldn't it be great if we had a tap in the refreshment room? This is a great to start us to the building. It's rather difficult to change. It's, um, it's almost 200 years old, so we're working with um, challenges, but we want to develop the space, and that needs investment. That's why we want to do it. Why? What's the purpose of it? Not, not just so that we can have a nice space, but so that guests coming can actually um, not be put off at the very first meeting when they're kind of crossing their legs and they have to wait uh, so with a queue for ages to get to the loo, or um, you know, they want to start helping and they can't. We've got a, a flourishing mothers and toddlers group here. Um, we moved it from downstairs in the crypt up here. It just exploded um, in terms of uh, numbers of people coming. It's going to keep on growing. We want to make that a space where people are comfortable when they're coming um, so that they can encounter the love of this Christian community and come to join it in their own time and so on. There are lots and lots of ways we're using this space. We want to invest in this site. We're, tr we're trying to raise about £50,000 to invest in stuff on the site. Last week we raised 21,000 towards this um, total, which is amazing. We're really excited about um, uh, develop, you know, just raising all that money over the next um, week or so. So, going back to why we would do that, is to seize the opportunities that are given. To seize the opportunities that God gives us to share our faith, like this opportunity that Philip had. And thirdly, leave a lasting legacy. Leave a lasting legacy. Let's pick up the story. So the eunuch says to Philip, well, picking up verse 36. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's some water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. It's an interesting thought how that happened. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. So here we have... The Ethiopian responding to the message. He says, yes, I want to become a Christian. There's some water. Can I be baptized? Can I have this outward symbol of what's going on inside my life expressed publicly? I want to actually become a member of God's church. I want to do this right now. What's to stop me? And he says, come on, seal the deal. And um, Philip goes, they go down towards him. He's baptized. This man... This Ethiopian eunuch is the first non-Jew to be converted and baptized. He was a black African man. He went back to Ethiopia, and um, it, I'm not sure, legend or more, but actually Ethiopia came 
over the next decades and centuries to be a Christian nation. That man was responsible for the conversion of a nation, the impact of that nation on a whole continent. From that conversation that Philip had, where Philip was obedient to God's prompting. Because he was obedient, because he just responded, Lord, I'm going to do what you say. I'm going to respond to the opportunities you give me. I'm going to seek the seekers. I'm going to seize the opportunity that you give to me. And I'm going to see what impact. I'm going to leave it with you, God, but I want to leave something which is going to make a difference in people's lives. And in this case, it affected the potential of a whole continent. One conversation in the back of a car. What legacy are you going to leave in Shadwell and East London for the Lord? This church has, has been a worshipping community on this site for 350 years. This church is almost 200 years old. It was built to glorify God and to be left as a legacy for future generations of worshippers. We are just one of those generations. But what difference are we going to make? Not just, you know, I don't mean to the building. I mean, actually, we should look after this legacy that we've been given so that actually it's better that we, when we pass it on to others. But what legacy are you going to leave in people's lives? We've all got a choice just to live our own life, our own way, or we can say, Lord, I'm open to you. What do you want me to do? How can I live my life in in my workplace to be a blessing to those people, to be a blessing to um, the very structures that I'm working within, I'm serving? How can I leave a legacy with, with my community, my neighbors, the people around me? How can I leave a legacy with my friendship circle, my networks that I'm, I'm involved with? What impact am I going to... You know, will, will people even know that I am an ambassador of God? Ambassadors are people who are outwardly focused. They know that they're representing their nation to others. My dad was um, in the Navy, and for three years we were um, based in the Philippines. My father's a defense attaché. And I remember my parents were drilling it into me again and again. People think that all children in Britain are like you. So you must behave when you go out. So when, we were, uh, when I was arguing with my brother, you know, my mum would just go... They think Britain's like you guys, <laughs> so always arguing. So it's like, okay, yes, we can say. <laughs> but the point is, actually, we were representing our nation in that place. It didn't matter how we felt, we, we had to do that. We were doing that. As Christians, we are ambassadors. We are God's ambassadors. But it's such a better task. We've got the message that changes people's lives for forever that we can give to people. They can take it or leave it, but we can give it. We can offer it. We can be those ambassadors. We want to leave as St. Paul's shadow. We want to leave a legacy in this place that's going to change the people around us. You know, that's why we plant churches. We want to impact this whole area. That's why we um, invest in things like XLP, a youth charity that is working with um, the vulnerable of young people in secondary schools. That's why we have a debt advice center um, helping people who are trapped in debt. That's why we have a night shelter here on Monday nights where we're part of a, a partnership of churches offering the most vulnerable a place to sleep in, in, over the cold winter. That's why we have a food bank distribution center so that the people who are trapped in that, um, that gap between losing a job and um, beginning to get social security and so on, there's a gap that, where people don't have any money. They need food. Food bank helps them. That's why we want to um, get to know our neighbors and, and help them and actually see that there are issues. You know, just across the road, it's the number one place, in, in the, it's the number one worst place for child deprivation in the whole nation. Yet you'd never know from looking on the outside. It's all hidden behind doors. We need to be a community who loves our neighbors and who begins to actually, the solutions are not just in solving your kind of outward problems, it's actually solving the problems of the heart. That's why we need to share the gospel with people. How long are you going to be here? One year? Three years? Five years? 
perhaps five minutes. You're just a visitor here today, and welcome. But actually, what legacy are you going to leave? What does God want you to do? You can start asking that question, Lord, help me to know how I can play my part. If you're a member of the church, you're thinking about being a member of this church, join the church, join a team. And just have a look at the green cards in your seats. Join a team card. If you're not a part of a team, join one. This is a way to serve in the church. We've talked about praying. This is where you can serve in the life of church. Lots of different ways and more. So um, I love the fact that we're filming today so that um, we can have these messages on the web, but also so that on the other side of the um, car park, the mums who are um, nursing babies can actually see live what's going on. And Steve, the guy behind the camera, has set this up. He's the person who's actually said, I'd like to step forward, serve the church, and serve the community by developing the video work here. He said, I- I'm going to step up and do this. And he's, he's done a massive amount of work to get this up and running. And there's a team of people who, who um, want to gather around him to help. And if you want to be part of that team, go and see him. The Shad Patch, great name, is a vegetable garden out in our garden, which was developed by Beth House. She has a vision to see um, us transforming our environment in the city to, to actually grow vegetables for people who need nutrition. So actually the people who come to our food bank are able to have fresh vegetables grown on site. It's a simple, practical, and powerful message that actually makes a difference in people's lives. Beth said, I want to do it. I'm going to step up and give in that way. Lots of ways that anyone can either in leadership take a step forwards or actually we can com- come around some of those leaders and say, I want to help as well. Join a team. Serve. It's much more fun being with others because you know, we, in, in, you know, we can have a laugh serving together and we can grow um, within that. Get stuck in. The other way to leave that legacy is to give. To give to the life of this church. We are, have been able to do what we've been able to do because of the generosity of this church. You are a generous church. And we need to keep on with this message because new people come to the church all the time. But I want to encourage you to give. Um, I was saying last week that our Christian discipleship includes giving. We should be giving regularly as, as just part of our Christian life. So, you know, we want to make it possible for you to give by standing order. That's the best way so that our standing orders, the regular giving of the church, covers the regular outgoings of the church. That's, that's, that's you know, that makes sense, doesn't it? So if you're not doing that, about a third of the church giving by standing order, we'd love to make that two-thirds, recognizing not, not everyone can do that. But if you're not, there are ways to do that. There are standing order forms um, at the back of church. But also today we want to encourage people to give a one-off gift towards investing in this site. We don't actually, most of the time we haven't invested in the site because we've been investing in our mission out of the church. But there are times when we need to just consolidate and say, actually, we want to develop this, not just for, um, for us to have a great worshipping space, which would be great, for guests to come, but also for the ways it's used midweek as well to develop those, um, the experience of those people give. And um, the way to do that just um, today, if you're a guest, if you're a visitor, please feel free to give to this vision. We'd love that. But take this kind of message home to heart for your own, um, where you've come from. But um, there are envelopes like this. If you're giving cash or a check, that enables us to get 25% back from tax back, which is fantastic. So that will increase straight away your investment. But also um, on the green cards, Flip it over and there's give. It's a different way of giving. So we can give with our time and joining a team. We can give financially. And um, there are lots of different options there, um, including a standing order. We can follow that up. But the ones I want to um, draw to your attention are giving a one-off gift today. You might tick that box and uh, drop that gift in the envelope. If, um, uh, if you gave last week, I just want to encourage you, we're going to all have an opportunity to respond. There's something that every one of us can do. So... If you're just a visitor and you want to know more, that's just a way of saying, actually, I'm not going to give here today. I'm just visiting. That's fine. We'd love that. But do, do tick that. And you can be part of our act of giving, which we're going to do just in a minute, um, by everyone participating. We'd love everyone to say, yes, I'm, I think this is a great vision. We want to get, get right behind it. Um, so there's something for everyone. And in a moment, we're going to have a time of worship and thanksgiving. Um, we're going to get this silver bowl. It's not silver. What is it? Chrome? I don't know, it's um, silver coloured and <laughs> people knew that we could sell it otherwise <laughs> um, and it'll be here just drop your card in, in the bowl and we're all going to do that kind of coming forward so this is 
what we call hilarious giving. Um, we want to have, uh, a, in, in 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about give with a cheerful heart. And that word cheerful is from the Greek word hilarion. So hilarious comes from that same word. So we give hilariously here um, and uh, drop that into the, the bowl and then we'll give thanks to God for that. So we're giving specifically to the, um, to the one-off gift um, to invest in the site. But also to, if you'd like to start standing or just take the box as well. So take some time, just the next couple of minutes, just to fill the cards out and, um, and then there'll be an opportunity to uh, actually an act of giving. Summing it up. I think God wants every one of us to be like Philip. We might not be great with being like an evangelist, like someone like J. John or Billy Graham, but every one of us can be like Philip in these ways. We can seek people who are seeking. All of us can do that. Just beginning to look out for people. Say, Lord, show me those people. Show me who's actually looking out for you. Who's in this 20 extra percent or 30 extra percent around me in my workplace or my community? Secondly, we can be like Philip by seizing those opportunities that come. And we can just, um, in J. John's words, feed on an as-need basis. Just give them what they need at that moment. It might be a great car journey or a bus journey or coffee with a neighbor. Whatever it is, seize that opportunity. And thirdly, like Philip, leave a lasting legacy. That one act led to a nation being converted. We don't know what legacy we leave, but if we say, Lord, I want to leave something that's going to last, that's going to outlast me, that changes our whole approach to the way that we engage with our world. Not me-focused, but other-focused. Changing other people's lives. Joining in with what God is doing. That's how to leave a lasting legacy. Would you like to stand?